All right, so high impedance versus low impedance. Uh, we also call it as high Z versus low Z uh, in audio terms. Uh, so essentially, the first question that comes to our mind is what would be, what is the basic difference between uh, high impedance or low impedance or high Z and low Z? So low impedance is usually uh, eight ohms uh, per se, and uh, high impedance is usually uh, 70 volts in Canada, uh, a lot of European countries, uh, South Asian countries have 100 volts. And for, you know, applications such as nurse call systems and stuff like that, they also use 25 volts. So anywhere where voltage, right, V is high impedance and uh, 8 ohms or 4 ohms or 2 ohms that we have heard is low impedance, right? So uh, on the slide, as you can see, uh, the low impedance range is you know, approximately from 2 to 16 ohms, and uh, uh, high impedance is 25, 70, or 100 volts. Uh, low impedance of systems are often used you know, for, I would say, pro sound applications, or especially in you know, places like nightclubs, restaurants, patios, uh, house of worship. Uh, home theaters and car studios uh, also use 8 ohms most of the time. Uh, high impedances are usually needed or used when there are multiple speakers, right? There are multiple speakers, and if it's a bigger infrastructure, you need a high impedance uh, 70 volt system. So <clears throat> also the speakers are not very high powered as compared to low powers, right? If you, if you have a home theater system where you have two tower speakers, right? They would be approximately 140 watt RMS each, or maybe 200 watt RMS each. Uh, but, you know, for, let's say, a hallway system in a school, uh, usually you have multiple ceiling speakers with, you know, which are tapped at just one watt. So they are not, you know, very high wattage, which is required in hallways and corridors. So also, you know, for applications that I just mentioned, like schools and hospitals and, you know, commercial and industrial projects, uh, there are n number of speakers, and the cable length is, uh, you know, long. The distance of cabling, and you know, the speaker placement is, you know, widespread. So in that case, it is very useful to use uh, uh, high impedance or 70 volt system. So technically, it's 70.7 volts uh, that that's being used on a wider basis. All right. So uh, when we talk about 70 volt, right? So what are the basic components? So you need an audio source. Right, so what what you're going to be feeding to the system, and then you need a 70 volt amplifier. Right, uh, most important uh, part of it is that uh, a lot of the speakers have a bypass switch at the back, so you got to be careful that when you're connecting them out of the box, a lot of them are are at 8 ohms by default, or a lot of the times they are at 70 volt by by default. So you got to make sure that you don't connect, you know, an 8 ohm speaker. Uh, or to a 70 volt system or vice versa. Like you don't want to connect a 70 volt speaker to an 8 ohm uh, amplifier, right? It could damage uh, the product. And usually for spec speaker wires, uh, a 16 by two copper, you know, uh, gauge cable can run up to a thousand feet. Uh, for pro audio application, the distance is not that long, right? Uh, you maybe a couple of feet uh, in, in a, in a space environment. Also, uh, speakers with transformers are capable of receiving a 70 volt signal. So the speaker in a 70 volt system is an 8 ohm, but there's a transformer which you know kind of uh, varies the uh, voltage signal that that is being fed. So that is uh, as far as what is a 70 volt system. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned, 770.7 and 25 volt, right? So we usually have uh, projects where we design using these speaker configurations. And a 70 volt system can have multiple tappings, right? So let's say if, it, if you buy a ceiling speaker, in this example, it is the F122C, that is our uh, ceiling speaker with back end, TOA ceiling speaker with back end. You could see in the image there are multiple taps. So all of these are 70 volt, but you could vary the tapping or vary the output wattage of the speaker just by turning the input selector switch. So it's very useful in an environment where you know, maybe, you know, you need just one watt. You just set the tap at the input selector switch to, let's say, one watt and see how it is performing. And then 
based on that, you could keep varying if you need more volume or if you need the speaker to be more loud, you could you know change the tab from maybe one watt to two watts or you know increments. So when you usually when you change the tapping, you get an additional three dB. Uh, the decibel variant that that is you know audible for a human ear to understand that okay there has been a volume change is three decibels. So once you change the tap, you can increase the volume by you know usually in steps of three dB, right? And uh, amplifiers have high voltage and high impedance outputs in this case, and uh, you know you mainly want to use this for a distributor speaker system where there are multiple speakers like I mentioned before, right? In the hallway they might be 10, 12, 30 speakers, you know, and you want to tap them all at, let's say, 1 watt or 1.5 watts or 2 watts or whatever, uh, they're all going to be on a 70 volt system. Now, comparison with regards to a 70 volt system versus an 8 ohm system, uh, especially uh, when it comes to large scale projects, like, for example, if it's a warehouse or an industrial space or commercial space or even a, you know, automobile showroom you know, like Honda or Toyota or Porsche. Uh, there are multiple speakers. There's one in the, you know, en entry reception area. There's one in the back uh, service area. There's one in the uh, waiting area and stuff like that. So there are multiple areas where you need speakers, right? So when you use a 70 volt system, uh, it tends to be more cost effective, uh, you know, uh, as compared to an 8 ohm system, because just imagine, uh, multiple cables coming in and the amount of amplification you would need uh, for an 8 ohm system uh, will be much more, uh, right? And also the, the wiring, the cabling part of it is very, very easy. And let's say you want to add a couple of more speakers, it is, you know, kind of more flexible as compared to an 8 ohm system. Or even, for example, you want to reduce or downsize, it's much more easier on a 7 dual system as compared to an 8 ohm system. And uh, like I gave you the example of a car dealership, right? So the reception area uh, uh, and where the cars are on display, you know, you need soft background music, the ambient noise or the overall noise in the space is less. But in the back where there's a service area, you know, there are uh, machineries and everything out there. So there might be some kind of uh, noise, so to say. So you could tap the speakers in those areas to a higher wattage. So you have that option of optimizing the sound pressure levels uh, on a 70 volt system rather very easily. Eight ohms. So when we talk about eight ohms, it is usually, you know, when you need, you know, like high fidelity, when you go for a rock concert, or you go to you know a live uh, event, uh, you see big line array speakers and big subwoofers. Uh, you need high quality audio when you are you know in a space like that. So in that case, uh, most of the time they are all eight ohm systems, right? With high power speakers and high power amplifiers and whatnot, right? And you know so many speakers, so many amplifiers, they all add up to the cost. Right, so they turn out to be an expensive system as compared to a 70 volt. But again, uh, if it's a house of worship or if it's a live concert or a you know a live gig, you need that kind of audio output. You need that kind of fidelity, right? So in that case, uh, you know 99.9% .9 or rather, I should say 100% of the time, people prefer eight ohm system because it gives you that output, right? So. Uh, you can calculate uh, impedance of the speakers per channel to make sure you know they fall within the range of amp. There are certain tips and tricks uh, which will come across uh, in the slides, uh, upcoming slides. Uh, but again, you cannot, you know, if if for example each channel of an amplifier has a limitation of the output power that it can provide to a speaker, you cannot go and just exceed, right? So if you overpower uh, the amplifier, right? With, with regards to the speaker, the damage the amplifier. And the other way around, if the amplification is higher and the speaker is tiny, you know, regardless if it's an 8 ohm system, if you bump up the volume, it might damage the speaker. So you have to be very careful when you're calculating the uh, impedance and the speaker wattages. So connection types. So a parallel connection, you know, there are basically two types of uh, connection that are usually used when in an 8 ohm system. So let's say you have an amplifier, right, with one channel, and uh, you have to connect two speakers in a parallel configuration. So what essentially is, 
you have uh, both of them like positive, positive, negative, negative being connected to the positive and negative respectively. So that gives you uh, eight ohms uh, divided by two, right? Because that's the impedance, that's the eight ohm impedance that you're using. And the number of speakers that you have is two. So you divide that and you get a four ohm uh, impedance. A lot of the home theater amplifiers or home receivers have a range. If you see at the back or in the manual, it says range of four to eight ohms, right? A lot of speakers, uh, pro, you know, professional amplifiers also have a range, uh, power amplifiers as we call them, have a range of from two ohms uh, to 16 ohms. So you have to be very careful the way you connect. So it's not always that you just want to connect one speaker to one channel of the amplifier. You might want to connect two of those uh, to that amplifier. So you got to make sure that you connect them in parallel and you balance, balance out the voltages. Now this is uh, what, what we spoke right now is about the parallel connection. Now we'll go ahead and talk about series. Uh, in a retail space application, right? You have you know a couple of speakers uh, that you need. You can connect them in series, just making sure that you connect. You know, you make sure that you <clears throat> uh, the voltage calculation is done appropriately. So it's like positive, negative, positive, negative, and positive is connected to the positive, and negative is connected to the negative, as you can see in the flow. Uh, of the image, right? So you have an 8 ohm impedance and you're connecting two speakers that essentially gives you 16 ohms, right? So you got to uh, multiply by two in this case. All right, so advantages when using low impedance system, uh, like I mentioned, you know, for stereo applications, you need an 8 ohm system, right? Uh, when you have a turntable at your house and you want nice two bookshelf speakers or four standing speakers, uh, you want an 8 ohm system, right? The amplifier that you have, two channel has to be an 8 ohm system. You wouldn't kind of get that high fidelity from a 70 volt system. And 70 volt systems are mono, mono output only, right? So, like I mentioned, when you're listening uh, in this particular example with regards to home audio system, you need you know, clarity, you need a broad frequency response, you need to hear the low, the mid, and the highs very clearly. So with regards to that, uh, an 8 ohm system is preferred uh, uh, in a home audio situation, but in a school hallway or corridor, the announcement is important, right? What the person is trying to convey, uh, be it an emergency announcement or be, you know, any general paging announcement, you want to make sure that it's audible enough and you're able to understand what is being said. So 70 volt system takes care of that. So this is a typical 8 ohm uh, system configuration that we have. So uh, for example, uh, let's assume that this is a retail space, if, if you can say that, and you need an input BGM source, OK? So maybe you know it's a wireless streaming device. Uh, it's an auxiliary cable that goes into the iPad or your phone, and you can play your sources from that. And this background music source is connected to the <clears throat> amplifier, right? So uh, low will become four ohms. Okay, so in this case, it's uh, there are two eight ohm speakers, <clears throat> excuse me, and they are connected uh, in parallel to the input. Uh, you know, since it's a four ohm amplifier, so they are connected in a parallel mode and uh, as you can, there's no polarity shown here, if I can zoom in, uh, but yeah. So the positive is connected here, and the negative is connected to the negative port. And it's a photo amplifier, and again, it's an 8 ohm speaker, but you can connect them if you connect them in parallel, right? Uh, you cannot add, you know, for example, three speakers, because you cannot balance out the impedance, right? Or you cannot have seven speakers connected to the system because you know you cannot balance out the impedance. So that is the limitation of an 8 ohm system that you have to make sure that the impedance matching is done correctly. Uh, in 70 volt system, you know, you can have multiple speakers, right? As long as uh, the wattage uh, of the speaker with regards to the amplifier channel is maintained, right? So let's say you have five speakers Right, five ceiling speakers. Again, we'll be talking about a scenario of a hallway or uh, corridors and stuff like that, where you need, you know, just an audible announcement. You don't need, uh, you know, a background music or anything of that sort. So, with regards to that, you have five 70 volt speakers. Uh, they are all connected 
<clears throat> as one watt tapped, right? So in totality, you have five speakers, total five watts connected to the seven volt, uh, 70 volt amplifier. Now the advantage, if you see, if I could just take the slide uh, back again, yes. So they are all connected in parallel. Okay, let's say if you know one of the speakers is supposed to go back for whatever reason, uh, that does not stop uh, the next speaker that is in the loop or the chain to get the announcement or to get the message, right? So in this speaker there are, uh, in this example there are five speakers. Let's say speaker number three goes bad for whatever reason, uh, the system will not fail. You will still have announcement from speaker number one, two, uh, four, and five. Right, so it just doesn't completely shut down the system, right? So uh, point number three, failure of a speaker or an open speaker transformer will not cause the system to fail. It's very essential, right? Because you know, otherwise the maintenance cost and whatnot will be way higher as compared to uh, an AROM system. All right, and again, uh, I'm, you could tap these speakers at different tappings as long as you are within the range of the amplifier, and uh, a selection of power taps on each speaker allows for you know the level of adjustments in different areas. So it could be an outdoor parking lot in a school where you need horn speakers. So let's say they are tapped at 15 watts. And the corridor speakers that I just uh, spoke about are tapped at one watt. So they're gonna be five watts uh, in total, one watt into five speakers. And you might have, let's say, three horn speakers, 15 watt each outside you know, in the parking lot and that could be around 45 watts. So <clears throat> you can mix and match uh, speakers, you can mix and match the wattages, you can mix and match the types of speakers. It need not necessarily be just ceiling speakers or only horn speakers, right? And uh, again, adding or removing speakers will not affect uh, the volume levels on existing speakers. Let's say you get rid of the horn speakers that won't vary the output of the speakers in the hallways or the corridors, right? And let's say it's a big premises, right? It's, a, it's an industrial uh, premises or a big commercial building, you know? So speaker lens is always a concern, right? How much cable run can it take for the, it to sp support the speakers? So for 70 volt system, you could run it for a very long distance. We have a speaker uh, gauge, a uh, speaker cable gauge to distance chart. In the end, uh, I would request you guys uh, to maybe take a, a, a screenshot of that, or also it's available on our website. Uh, you, you know, it comes in really, really handy when you're working on a project, uh, right? And you know the distance is about, you know, maybe 1,500 feet. So it'll give you, and you have an, uh, you know, speaker uh, wattage of around maybe let's say 600 watts. So you, it, it'll give you the gauge of the cable that you're supposed to use for that wattage and the total length. So it comes in really, really handy when you're working or designing, you know, 70 volt system. So uh, I would request you to take a screenshot or send in an email to Nelson and he could send you the link on our website. Right? Yeah. Uh, you can also, let's say, for a 70 volt system, like we kept talking about, you know, how we manage the impedance and this and that. But uh, you know you want to adjust the volume control, right? So for each zone, you could have a volt attenuator. Simple. So it's very easy to also manage the volume control part of it. It need not necessarily be from the head end amplifier. It can also be done by a local volt attenuator. And TOA has an entire lineup of you know volt attenuators starting from three watts to 100 watts to all the way to programmable uh, you know keypad controls. Okay, here we are talking about a typical 70 volt system, uh, very similar to what it was before, but uh, you know this is going to be working on a 70 volt. So as you can see, we have our BGM input source. Uh, it could be DVD, it could be a streaming device, it could be a cell phone. Uh, you also have paging microphones, right, for making emergency or regular announcements. Now in this case, you have 70 volt speakers, okay. And you could have multiple speakers as long as you're not exceeding the wattage requirement of the amplifier. So they're all connected in parallel. And at the same time, there's no restriction of having just two or four or, or eight, you know, in, in terms of managing the impedance because it's 70 volt. So you could have even odd number of speakers, let's say three or four or five or seven or nine, <clears throat> as long as you are within the wattage uh, range of the amplifier. 
also you can see you could connect the volume attenuator or volume control in simple terms on the wall uh, which is you know connected to the speaker line and goes to the attenuator from there it goes back to the amplifier so whenever you change the volume attenuator it will in most cases be a 3 db up or a 3 db down and you could vary uh, the volume level for example uh, if it's a restaurant okay in restaurants during afternoon or you know late afternoons there's not too much crowd in the restaurant right so you don't want the speakers to be very very loud right so let's say it's a saturday evening where there are a lot of uh, guests and a lot of customers at the restaurant and you know a lot of uh, talking about you know the basketball game and other stuff uh, you could kind of bump up the volume from the attenuator to make sure that the bgm volume goes uh, up so the volume attenuator you know tends to get in handy because the amplifier and the other devices are usually locked up in the rack and you don't want you know the uh, the manager of the restaurant to keep you know fiddling around with the knobs on the amplifier once it is set so a volume attenuator, attenuator always comes in very very handy all right so uh, we have covered uh, 70 volt 8 ohms what are the benefits of 8 ohms for example uh, you know home audio systems or pro sound applications and 70 volt for projects where you have longer cable runs and uh, multiple speakers right uh, now let's say you have a job or uh, let's say you have a request from a customer what are the things to keep in mind uh, before you start design okay so question number one where will the system be used so when you say system, uh, it, en it encompasses or it includes different peripherals. The number one peripheral that usually uh, we take into consideration are speakers, right? So in a restaurant application, uh, especially because of COVID-19, uh, you know, patios have opened up. So you want to make sure if you're putting speakers outside, they are weather resistant speakers, right? Uh, not just any regular speaker that you put outside because it has to deal with you know moisture humidity wind dust snow rain and all all those uh, you know weather conditions so you want to make sure uh, you have an ip grade weather resistant speaker outside uh, tua does have an entire lineup of weather resistant speakers backed up to very good warranty uh, with the tua <coughs> weather resistant speakers uh, so yeah we covered the outside part of it right now the indoor space uh, how reverberant is it right how are the uh, acoustic anomalies in the room is it very reverberant or you know it's nice and you know less uh, reverberant and the acoustics of the room are really good or you know they have reflective surfaces everywhere too much glass and stuff like that then you got to make sure you have uh, you know then you can narrow down whether you need a wide dispersion speaker or narrow dispersion speaker. So I'm just gonna take a minute to talk a bit more about wide dispersion or narrow dispersion speakers. Uh, usually, uh, in my experience, uh, when I used to work for an installation company, uh, with a highly reverberant space, uh, I would usually prefer having multiple speakers tapped at a lower tapping, okay? Uh, you know, let's say it, it's a space 250 square feet, just you know just for an example instead of having four speakers you know a lot of I've, i go to so many reverberant spaces uh, you know where for it could be a restaurant or a house of worship or whatever they just have <clears throat> four speakers in the corner firing everything in the middle and it's it's chaos you really can't hear anything you know so it defeats the whole purpose so uh, i would recommend or i would suggest uh to have speakers spaced evenly apart with even tapping. You might need more number of speakers, but with the lower tapping, it really helps to, you know, kind of overcome the reverberant space issue. At the same time, giving intelligible uh, audio announcements or music to, to the end customer. So that is really, really important. Uh, and reverberant spaces are very, very tricky, especially for house of worship, because you have, you know, like high ceilings. Uh, so you got to make sure that you use 
you know, a narrow dispersion speaker, or you know, if you're using a wide dispersion speaker, you the placement of the speaker also matters, right? You want to make sure it covers the entire space where people who have come for the worship or the prayers uh, can listen clearly of whatever is being said in the space. So again, you need the width, the length, and the height of the room. Right, you need to do some basic math, basic calculations. So, depending on how big the space is, how high the ceiling is, and how long the space is, you you will need all this information for for you to do the calculation. Right, uh, for ceiling again, uh, <clears throat> you know, if it's an undocked return air, you know, whether you need plenum uh, rated speakers or not, again, that's a question to ask. So, uh, these are you know the questions you need to know uh, with regards to where the system will be used. Now, point number two is what will the system be used for? Is it for background music, just something which is going to be played in the background, or foreground music, or is it going to be used for paging, right? Is it just that they're going to be using for paging or, or signaling just to you know announce or let the customers know uh, what what deals are going on in Best Buy or Walmart or Canadian Tire, or is it just music? In some application, it's a combination of background music and paging. So uh, there is some music going on in the store, right? Be it the clothing store or anything else, and you're shopping, and the, the manager wants to make an announcement, so presses the microphone button, so it ducks the music, and the page comes through. Uh, we have 50% off now for the next 30 minutes, uh, Black Friday special deal. And once the page is over, the music bumps back again. So a lot of cases, depending, you know, the customer's requirement, we have to figure out whether it's only BGM or paging or both or anything else, right? And a lot of the times, uh, we need to be very clear with the quality of the sound the customer needs. Is it high fidelity that they're looking for? Or are they looking for just you know basic paging, right? So you don't want to oversell a system and then you know uh, be disappointed when it doesn't turn up, like you don't get the job. So you got to make sure of that. Also, like I mentioned, a lot of spaces uh, require a good amount of you know like the low lower end thump or deep bass. So that would be you know restaurants or uh, the high-end clothing stores where they have, you know, some nice uh, music playing in the background with a good vibe uh, for the customer. So they need a little bit of bass, right? So you got to add maybe a subwoofer, you know, in the corner of the store or, you know, ceiling mount subwoofers or whatnot, just to make sure that you are able to fulfill whatever the customer needs, right? And again, uh, when used for speech or paging, what level of intelligibility is expected, right? So basically, <clears throat> intelligibility is... If a person is standing anywhere in the premises, he, sh he or she should be able to listen to the announcement uh, very clearly, right? Uh, I would refer back to the example that I gave a couple of minutes ago uh, in a 250 square foot environment, right? You have four speakers in the corner. The person just standing below the speaker will obviously be able to listen very clearly and will able to un will be able to understand the announcement that is made. But what about the person in the middle of the room? Right, he's he's the person who's you know far away from the speaker at the corner. So you got to make sure your speaker placements are right, that a person anywhere in the premises is able to hear the announcement very very clearly. So that again is a very important point uh, to consider. All right, how loud will the system be? Right, so usually we would go into the space, uh, check you know uh, the dB level, or most of the time we would keep it on. For, for 24 hours to make sure we know what DB level goes throughout the day. Uh, in the morning, maybe when you, the space isn't very crowded, the noise level is going to be low. In the evening, the space is very crowded, the noise level is going to go higher, right? So you got to make sure you study that. Uh, also, what kind of system is being used, uh, you know, for foreground material? Like, is, is there a system that is being used for foreground material? Uh, point number four, how will the speakers be mounted, right? So there are different types of speakers, right? Ceiling mount, wall mount, or pendant. Uh, or you could also use pro audio speakers and you've got to rig them, right? So you've got to fly them. So based on that, you have to select the brackets. Uh, these days, a lot of commercial spaces are chucking down the uh, reflected ceilings. They prefer uh, open ceiling concepts uh, that we, you know, most of the time I do site visits, I see that's the trend, open ceiling, open conduits. 
in that case, you would need a ceiling speaker maybe with a back end, or you would need warm warm speakers, or you would need pendant speakers if the ceiling height is pretty good. So again, you gotta note this, these points down. They are very, very important. And also, like I mentioned before, uh, does the customer need low end uh, audio, right? Base. So you gotta have, you know, well, make sure whether the customer is going to need subwoofers. And if yes, where are you gonna place them? And what part of the room you gonna place them? Point number five, <clears throat> what will the speaker spacing be? So depending on the standard speaker, you know, so usually space them in square pattern or hexagonal patterns. Uh, based on the pattern, you can determine what performance or how even is the level between the speakers. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, I'm not sure whether many of you may be aware, uh, but there is a software called as Ease uh, Focus <clears throat> and Ease Evac. So they are very useful softwares which we here at TOA use to help our customers with their projects. So let's say we get a drawing from a customer saying it's a retail space and uh, the ceiling height is you know x feet, the length is y feet, and you know uh, the depth is uh, you know z feet. We get the information and we ask them that do you have a budget for high fidelity speakers or you want to go for a more budget oriented approach? So we have we ask them all the questions that I just discussed you know a couple of minutes ago, and based on that then we take the layout, the flow layout that has been sent to the customer, put it into the software, and plot the speakers into the software. So it's basically a heat map of the speakers in the space, right? Because audio is, you know, it's unlike visual, you cannot see sound, right? You gotta hear them. So the heat map helps the customer visualize how the output audio is gonna be in the space, right? Is it gonna be intelligible? Is it, you know, uh, the variance in the DB level is not too much, so that if the person is moving around the space, he gets almost the same uh, intelligibility around the space, which is very, very crucial. So we do use uh, softwares uh, with the help uh, of which we can, you know, uh, make the customer understand and make it very easy to determine. And in that software, we plot the speakers either in a square or a hexagonal path. So that again is very, very important. Okay, uh, the next point, after you determine, you know, indoor speakers, outdoor speakers, what kind of speakers do you need? And uh, where you, how are you gonna place them? Are you gonna need a subwoofer? Are they gonna be pendant or backend or whatnot? Then the next question is, okay, once you determine the quantity of speakers and the wattage of the speakers at what you're gonna tap them at, uh, do we need to move the amplification for? Uh, so let's say in totality, you have a thousand watts. Or speakers, right? Uh, of speaker wattage. So you would need uh, an amplifier which is more than thousand watts. Uh, there's a small calculation for that, which are which is going to be coming in the upcoming slides. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a bit. So again, amplifier power will depend on the number of the speakers and the power setting at what you tap at. Uh, and each speaker power tap setting will depend on the distance of the speaker from you know the audience, the sound pressure levels and ambient noise levels and whatnot. Uh, wiring gauge will depend on the cable run and the wattage delivered. So if you know it's crazy high wattage and if it's crazy length, the, the gauge will be you know uh, weary. And if it's lower wattage and lower cable run, again the wiring gauge will weigh. That's when the speaker wiring tapping sheet will come in handy. Okay. Uh, point number seven, you could connect all of these to a normal, you know, 70 volt amplifier with an input source. But again, a lot of the spaces need audio processing, right? You want to really make sure that the speakers that you're using, you are using them to uh, their optimum level, right? So you would need uh, something which is called as DSPs or digital signal processors. So you could tweak the speakers really, really well. So, which will help you in you know frequency correction to improve the sound quality, and also in a lot of space where they're going to be using microphones simultaneously in the same space, and God forbid if it's reverberant space, you have to have a digital signal processor because it'll help you to you know avoid the challenges that come with feedback and uh, possibly reduce it. <clears throat> and also, they have various features such as the feedback suppression and whatnot. So. Uh, the TOA lineup consists of a uh, 9000 M2, that's an uh, M9000 uh, 8x8 mixer. Very efficient, 
Uh, it's a modular based product that we have. You can look it up on our website. Uh, it's very useful where you need eight zones and you need compression, EQing, and whatnot. Then we have the D901, D2008 uh, speaker processing uh, units. At the same time, we have M864. Uh, somehow it's not in the slide. Uh, it is a very handy digital mixer with an Android app, with an uh, i iTunes app. So you could control the levels and everything from the iPad once it is set. So it adds, you know, you know, multiple capabilities to, you know, optimize the sound outputs. You could also do muting, right? Like I mentioned, if there's background music being played, you press the button on the microphone, it'll duck the music, and the page will go through. And once you're done talking, uh, the page, uh, the background music will come back again. All right. Uh, point number three is uh, you could do compression, signal leveling. You could maintain a volume level, and you know you want to make sure you set the parametrics and everything really, really nice. So it sounds very rich. It sounds very clean, and it sounds very clear. So signal processing definitely uh, you know helps you to uh, add filters and whatnot, and make it uh, even more you know professional or clear sounding system. All right, uh, point number eight, we need to know, uh, do we need multiple amplifier zones, right? So depending on different sound sources, you know, you can route one sound source to let's say one area, the other sound source to another area. Uh, recently, uh, we worked on a project uh, for a restaurant which had uh, multiple locations, like I said, uh, you know, outside patio, uh, a normal restaurant downstairs and an upstairs with like really loud thumping music and they would want to have a guitarist come in and entertain the guests uh, at the patio section so we gave them an on wall you know unit to plug his guitar and stuff so that's a separate uh source for patio in the inside on the ground floor it's just background music right they had a dvd hooked up with you know soft background music going on and on the level one uh they had like a dj booth and everything it was like you know really thumping music so there were three different uh, same restaurant but three different uh zones uh and three different uh, you know kind the level of music and the input sources were totally different so in that case you know you could go for multi-channel amplifiers and we have an entire lineup uh of da series amplifier so they are available in 250 watt into four channels so that gives you thousand watt in just one u uh then there is 500 watts 550 watts uh into four channels so almost 2000 watts uh in one amplifier and again with the help of the m9000 m2 that i mentioned you could have up to eight zones uh, the example that i just gave you was for just for three zones imagine you can scale that to up to eight zones so that's pretty good, right? Eh? Uh, point number nine, what type of sound sources are gonna be needed? Uh, for paging, you will need uh, a simple push to top microphone. If it's just one zone, you just press the button and you make the page, right? Uh, in the example that I just spoke about a moment ago, there are three zones, right? So you could use uh, something called as the QRM9012. We have a eight zone paging microphone. So you press one, and you push to talk, the page goes to the patio area. You press two, you talk, it goes to the normal, you know, ground level zero uh, restaurant area. You press three, it will go to the level one uh, where there's loud thumping music. So the pay, the music ducks in and you can make an announcement. And once you're done with the page, the music comes back again. Or uh, if it's a all call announcement, you could press all and the page will go through all the three zones. So we have that capability as well. You know, it's it's very very useful for the customer. At the same time, some customers prefer using the phone uh, the phone paging, right? So you could connect uh, a module to the 9000 series, and you could pick up your analog phone and do the page. Uh, we also now have a SIP uh, based paging module, which enables you to use your SIP phones, uh, dial the extension, and make the page. So it could be through a microphone, it could be through an analog phone, it could be through a you know wipe uh, or an IP phone as well, right? And then uh, for music sources, you could have DVD, CD players, you know, you could plug in your phone, satellite services, and wireless streaming and whatnot. 
Uh, at the same time, you, we also suggest, uh, based on case by case basis, to have uh, you know a digitally recorded message. Uh, I would like to explain this with an example. Uh, for example, uh, if it's school premises, right, and <clears throat> if there is an emergency in the school, you don't want a person to be standing there making the announcements continuously, right? Because let's say life is in danger, there's a fire situation or whatnot. So we have a, a device which has pre-recorded digital message. So you press the button, right? And it will keep announcing the message, right? Uh, and it, it is very useful in uh, where uh, evacuation is needed or any particular, uh, or for example, in schools in the morning time, we could also play O Canada uh, via this pre-recorded digital uh, message box, right? So it comes in very, very handy based on different applications. Then we have tone modules for signaling alert, right? Then those are called essays modules. Uh, then there is the ability to mute BGM sources when paging. Uh, I've discussed this a couple of times. Also, you can control from fire panel alarms for muting the audio system. So let's say uh, a system needs a high-end uh, mass notification system. Uh, you could also communicate with the fire alarm panels, right? So this we are talking about dual rated uh, mass notification panels. Uh, TOA does have that as well. It's called the VM3000 lineup. So uh, what it essentially does is uh, the fire panel comes to a neutral box and the VM comes to a neutral box and they can communicate with each other, uh, which is very, very good uh, when customer or when there's a project requirement for a mass notification system. So that's pretty interesting. All right, so which type of system uh, should you go for? Should you go for a high impedance uh, system or a low impedance system? So like I said, if you have a house of worship, or you have an auditorium, you need a home theater or a car stereo or stuff like that, you need to prefer a low impedance system that is eight ohms uh, because you know the cable length is not you know too long. Uh, you might need a heavier gauge uh, of cable, but again, it you know it is it is what it is, and uh, constant and minimum impedance must be maintained by using the series parallel wiring of speakers that we spoke in the previous slides. Okay, when do you use a high impedance system? Suppose it's a multi-zone paging system like I just discussed, the restaurant application or a school or an industrial space, and you need to have background music and paging and whatnot. Uh, you can go for an, you need to go for a high impedance system because you know it's going to be cost effective. You could have longer, uh, you know, length of cable and longer, you know, speakers placed upon at different locations, and it's easy to control you know, using volume attenuators. Like I mentioned, we have uh, an entire lineup of volume attenuators uh, called as AT 063P, AT 303P, and so on and so forth. Right, and again, the most important part of a high impedance system is since all the speakers are connected in parallel, uh, you don't have to worry about constant uh, maintenance of the impedance to the amplifier or the system itself because these systems are you know built to last if if installed correctly and again uh, all the TOA products that we sell are backed by a five-year warranty uh, that's pretty neat and the uh, Heinzman system you know tends to have lower maintenance as compared to an 8 ohm system all right uh, designing your system so uh, Based on uh, what we just discussed, right, uh, sound pressure level or the dB level is very, very important as we, uh, you know, monitor or uh, cater to a specific uh, customer requirement. Uh, if it's an industrial space with a lot of, you know, heavy machineries and stuff like that, you will need to have a speaker with a high dB output level. Uh, if it's a restaurant or a hallway or a corridor, it could be uh, a speaker which doesn't need to be higher wattage or you know high dB output volt, uh, wattage. Uh, here are some reference examples. So when a person is you know at five feet and if there is if the room is very quiet and if there is a soft whisper, that is roughly around 30 to 32, 33 dB uh, sound pressure level. Uh, in an office environment, in a private office environment, you know, people talking on the phone or maybe, you know, uh, working, that's around 50. Average male voice in conversation is 70 dB, which I believe is right now. I'm talking at 70 dB. 
Uh, 90 dB, let's say you're stuck in traffic, all, all the engine noise and stuff like that, that's going to be uh, a 90 dB. Uh, and you guys go to a rock concert, uh, uh, you know, you're in the front of the row, uh, really enjoying the blast from the speakers, that's around 115 dB. So, like I mentioned, uh, an average listener, be it you or me, uh, can hear a 3 dB change in volume levels, right? So, whenever you bump up a volume by 3 dB, a, a human ear can detect it. And it's, you know, a perception that the volumes have leveled, uh, you know, volumes have increased. Uh, but once, you know, you double it up uh, to 10 dBs, it is very, very evident that there has been an, you know, increase in the volume level. So if it's a slight change, maybe one dB, two dB, two and a half dB, it's very difficult for a human here to actually detect uh, the increase in the sound pressure level. All right, a uh, very important point. While choosing a speaker, a lot of my customers ask me, you know, why, why do you recommend this particular speaker against the other one? Because uh, that one is, you know, the price is really good on that. Uh, the reason is because I always ask what is the sound pressure level in the space that they are looking for to install the speaker. So whenever you look at the spec of any speaker, it says sensitivity, in this case, for example, is 90 dB at 1 watt, 1 meter. So let's say it is I said at 1 watt, at this 1 meter, you're going to get around 90 dB, right? So all manufacturers measure the speaker on axis at 1 meter distance, right? It is called a reference distance. Uh, by applying a one watt complex signal that is usually referred as one watt one meter uh, a high sensitivity is desirable right so you need the 90 db uh you know uh, a higher db number essentially uh which will give you a higher sensitivity on the speaker which is needed uh based on the application right so how much power to increase the volume spl level for example, uh, one watt of power measure one meter from the speaker, right? So physics states that for every doubling of power, we need a change of three dB. So if you increase the amplifier power from, let's say, one watt to two watt, you change the tapping on the speaker from one watt to two watt, uh, the speaker that initially produced 90 dB at one watt will now produce 93 dB at one meter. The reason why? Because we have doubled the wattage, right, from one watt to two watts, but it will give you an increase in increments of three, right? So you'll get 93 dB. Increase the power to four watts, right? And you keep adding three dBs, right? So it's 96 dB at one meter. Actually, it should be uh, one, two, yeah, four watts, right? 96 dB at one meter. So here are the examples. One watt, 90 dB, two watt, 93 dB, four watt, 96, eight watts, 99 dB. These are all at one watt, one meter. Right, so you have to look at the spec and determine what the uh, dB levels are at the space where you are planning to install the speaker. At the same time, you have to look at what sensitivity the speaker offers. So you have to make sure it matches uh, correctly. All right, uh, loss of volume uh, over distance. Okay, so in this example, uh, we said one watt, one meter, right? So no customer or no person is going to be that close to the speaker in an environment, right? So as we move away from the speaker, the sound level tends to decrease. Uh, the main question is how much, right? Once again, uh, physics tells us that uh, the volume level decreases uh, in a conventional speaker system by 6 dB for every doubling distance, right? So let's say if we listen to the speaker on axis at 2 meter distance, right, uh, the level will be uh, in this example, one watt, one meter was 90 dB, it will deduct by 6 dB. So it will be 84 dB. Let's say you are four meters away from the same speaker, it will be 90 minus 12, that is 78 dB. So you can just imagine you just are like, uh, you know, four meters away, and this is the, uh, just, just see the amount of uh, drop. So technically, it is, you know, I think 13.2 uh, feet away from the speaker and the dv level has dropped from 90 to 78 so you have to be very careful because when you are working on a design you've got to make sure that the sensitivity of the speaker is uh you know up to the level that you're going to need at the same time you have to take into consideration how far uh you know the the, the person who's going to be listening to the intelligible announcement is going to be and based on that you got to set the tapping on the speaker.
Okay, so I've already discussed this, but just in pictorial forms, it's going to be very useful. So if you guys want to take a screenshot, feel free to do that. Uh, like I said, uh, first example is one watt, one meter reference at 90 dB. At two meter, it becomes 84 dB. At four meter, it becomes 78 dB. And that, uh, uh, yeah, and it keeps on decreasing as you go away from the speaker source, right? So you can see there is an image of the speaker tapping at the back, all right? So uh, the, the design calls for 84 dB at your level. So in this case, uh, we see uh, the two uh, examples, right? So uh, at one watt, if it is 78 dB at your level, at two watts, it will be 78 plus 3 dB at your level. So you got to set them at roughly around four watts. So we don't have a four watt tapping. So assume you're going to set it at five dB. So you would get somewhere around 84 dB. So in this particular application, it will be audible enough. So you set the tapping a little higher as that you, uh, you know, as the in distance increases, you set the tapping accordingly, right? Uh, so this is a very useful, you know, example with regards to understanding the sensitivity part of it, one watt, one meter. Okay. So what happens off axis? So on axis and off axis is, you know, essentially when you are in line of sight, I would say in simpler terms. So when you are moving away from the speaker, the volume level decrease even more as we are from the off axis. Let's say you are right in front of the speaker and you keep going away from the speaker, the volume level is reducing by 6 dB, 6 dB, 6 dB. But imagine you are, you know, going away from the speaker at the same time you're going off axis, uh, that further, you know, reduces the coverage. So speaker manufacturers define the coverage angles based on when the speaker levels off axis drop 6 dB from the axis response. Uh, suppose the coverage specification for the speaker was 60 degrees horizontal at 200 hertz. Uh, this means that the off axis volume levels are down 6 dB, right? Uh, 30 degrees each side on the axis response in the horizontal plane. Okay, let's make this simple. Uh, uh, a lot of the speakers, uh, if you remember in the previous slides, we talked about wide dispersion speakers or narrow dispersion speakers, right? And then in an application where you want to cover more space with less number of speakers, at the same time, you want to make sure that the DB level doesn't drop too much, you should prefer to go with wide dispersion speakers by setting the tap side. So let's say you are on axis, uh, in this example, it's zero DB, and you go off axis 30 degrees to the right or 30 degrees to the left you're going to be detecting a drop in uh, 6 dB, right? So you got to be careful uh, not only just selecting indoor and outdoor speakers, but when you do choose those speakers, uh, make sure that they are wide dispersion speakers if the applications call, call for it. And we have the F2000 series in, in uh, you know, uh, on-wall speakers available both in uh, weather-resistant IP rating and non-IP rating. Uh, both of them are, you know, wide dispersion speakers and excellent quality. All right, so knowing the off axis response of the speaker, uh, you know, is essential to understand the amount of even coverage uh, that you're gonna need. Uh, and it also determines how many speakers and what the spacing of the speakers will be. Let's say in this particular example, you have the first speaker, uh, you know, which, which is having a coverage of let's say 60 degrees, right? So you know the fact that on the right hand side, when it goes extended 30 degrees off axis, the volume level is going to drop by 6 dB, correct? So you want to make sure that you don't space out the second speaker too much away or too much far from the first speaker because you're going to make sure the intelligibility part of it. Now, what was the intelligibility part of it? That the variance in the audio level should not be uh, more than 3 dB because what will happen is if the person is moving around the space, the moment he reaches between the first and the second speaker, he's going to feel, a, you know, a different ambience. Like, oh, you heard the music was pretty good. You heard it sounds like dead. And then he walks through the other space and it's loud again, right? So you don't want that. You want to make sure that it's even throughout the space. So the wide, uh, knowing the off-axis response is very, very important uh, because it essentially helps you with how close the speakers should be spaced or how further apart they, they need to be spaced. So a um, very, very important point when you know deciding uh, speaker placements, right? 
paging horns. Now, I'm going to be using uh, an example of uh, an industrial application where you know there are you know you know uh, passages uh, where you keep all the racking and skids and everything, and you run your forklift and whatnot. If it's a big industrial space, so. Uh, a 50 foot spacing for a 20 foot ceiling, right? So it's essentially around 15.2 meters spacing for a six meter ceiling. <clears throat> so the horn features uh, in this example, let's assume it's a TOA SC630 TU horn. If it is placed at you know 20 foot uh, height, for example, and you could see that off axis. Uh, it is uh, 30 degrees, and on axis it is zero. Uh, sorry, off axis uh, it is you know minus 6 dB uh, on the left hand side, and on the other side it is again uh, minus 6 dB, and on axis is zero dB. So you got to make sure that you place the speakers uh, evenly, and the angle of the speaker it shouldn't be firing too high, otherwise you know you're just firing it off straight. And at the same time, you're not firing it too low that it, you know the person standing just below the speaker is able to hear the audible announcement. And when you start moving away from the range of the axis, you hear nothing. You don't want that. So you got to make sure that <coughs> when a person is walking in the aisles, uh, the audio announcement is you know very audible. So in usual cases, it's roughly around 45 to 50 feet space spacing of the speakers. So it's it's you know anywhere you walk from left to right you'll be able to hear the individual announcement and the variance will be only of around three dB. Okay, uh, how much amplifier uh, power do I need? So uh, in our example we found that uh, you know it's 90 dB at ear level, right? The one watt one meter example. And let's say we require 16 watt. However, the application does not have a lot of ambient noise, right? So let's say we are setting down. Uh, at 5 watts tap and producing, let's say, 84 dB at your level. Anyways, so long story short, I don't want to take uh, uh, much of your time because I'm almost close to my one hour mark. Uh, the rule of thumb is uh, to go for 20% more power as compared to whatever input wattage that you're going to need. So in this case, the speaker wattage example is, let's say, 95 watts, for example. Right, you calculated everything, and you're like, "Oh, my total is 95 watts." You have to add 20% to that. That is roughly around 114 watts. So the rule of thumb is to have 20% more margin uh, to make sure that you, you know, the all the safety precaution is taken uh, to make sure that the amplifier headroom is there and it doesn't damage the amplifier as well as it takes care of the speaker. Right. So 20% rule very important for calculating your headroom. Room setup uh, for BGM, you, you know, you could have ceiling speakers. For FGM, you could have wall mount or high impact speakers. <clears throat> for uh, you know, PowerPoint, you want to determine, right? I need a code on an audio system in a room that is 50 feet by 100 feet long. So you got to know the uses beforehand, right? Uh, DVD, do they need a theater style impact or paging? Is it just voice or live and you know, frequency range? Now, important point. <clears throat> Uh, point source versus distributor source. So, speaker is uh, mounted on the wall, and you are trying to direct it at a particular point. So that's called a point source. All right. So, uh, advantage of point source is if ceiling is too high, if ceiling is not suitable, you know, you could try to direct it at a particular uh, lateral uh, angle. Uh, Con, if you know, if you're too loud to it, it's going to be. If you're too close to it, it's going to be too loud. Right, and it doesn't have a very long throw distance. Distributor. Uh, uh, remember, we talked about the square pattern and the hexagonal patterns. Uh, this is an example of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the speaker being uh, plotted in a square shape pattern. So you are evenly distributing the speakers, right? So it's not very loud. It's tapped at uh, at lower voltages. So when you move around the space, it is audible, and it's not, you know, it's not going to blow your head away. Right, so the advantage, like I mentioned, even coverage, right? It looks good. Size of the room is not a factor. Is a wiring cons is limited to size. Uh, ceiling material will restrain certain installs, and also the quantities might go up. Right, you need more number of ceiling speakers. Uh, this is the one that I was talking about. The type of speaker wire that you need, right? So uh, you need a 16 gauge cable for an, uh, you know, eight ohm speaker at 250. Are. 
So these are, you know, this is the uh, number of feet of cable you can run for, you know, a given loss and performance budget. Uh, we also have a 70 volt version of this, uh, like like a full blown version of it on our website. Uh, you could check it out, or you could request Nelson, and he'll send you the link. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, it's a small video slide which I'm unable to play right now for some reason. Uh, but yeah, it, I just want to cover up the different uh, things that we uh, covered in today's slide. So first of all, we spoke about basically what is low impedance, what is high impedance, you know, 70 volt and 8 ohms. At the same time, <coughs> we tried and understand what's different between, and most importantly, where will the 8 ohm system fit more? Like you know, uh, home theater application, live uh, you know uh, applications, gigs and concerts, and for distributed audio and for commercial and you know school projects and stuff like that, you need 70 volt system is ideal. And uh, 8 ohms usually where there is high fidelity. And then we talked a bit about series and parallel connection for 8 ohms because it's, it is very, very important whenever you're talking about a low impedance system that the impedance has to be matched. It cannot be a mismatch system, otherwise it'll cause damage to the equipment. Uh, 70 volt system, we don't have to worry too much about that. You can have multiple speakers uh, being tapped at different voltages and uh, you could you know, really take it from there because it's parallel connection. And uh, uh, even if a speaker fails, it's not going to you know, kill the entire system. So that's pretty good. And then we talked a bit about you know how we should be designing the system, the factors that we need to take care of while considering the system uh, before we start designing uh, uh, the system. And then we talked about a few examples. And uh, yeah, we spoke about you know different axes, on axes, off axes, about increments of uh, decibel value, 3 dB uh, and 6 dB, and all those examples. Then we talked about point source. Uh, was a distributed source and we talked about different <clears throat> software that are used in today's times when you could uh, you know create an image of how the output is going to be uh, looking at uh, after we are done with the render so that's basically what we have covered uh, I appreciate